done lots of life stories, but I've never done anybody quite like Sir Elton John. He was just Reg Dwight from Pinner, and he became the greatest solo artist in British music history. I don't know what he's going to ask me. I want to talk about his extraordinary love life. I'm sure it's going to be a huge range of things, so uh, I'm pretty ready for it. I want to talk to him about his deep relationship with Princess Dinah. And tonight, he's also going to be performing two songs. Into the frying pan. This is a life story. I've waited 25 years to interview you. Yeah, and here I am. <laughs> <laughs> you said that all you ever get asked about in interviews is either flowers, tantrums, sexuality or your hair. Yes. Which one do you want to start with? Um, <laughs> fire away, I don't care. <laughs> so you're prepared to answer anything I throw at you? Well, mostly. Well, <laughs> well I'm a bit concerned about... I mean, you, you are known to be, you know, I wouldn't say demanding, but... I'm not known Prick to be prickly. demanding. I mean, I did tantrums and tiaras, which was, you know, about 13 or 14 years ago, um, which David, my partner, did on me. And I wanted to make a documentary about how people actually genuinely are. I mean, in most documentaries you see, you see people say, oh, they're so wonderful, they're so nice, oh, they're wonderful. <laughs> and, of course, we're not. We're absolutely sometimes sport brats. And I wanted that to come through on the, you know, sometimes under pressure we crack. Um, that's the way it is, and I wanted it to be a warts and all documentary, and I was very happy with it. It's one of the few things that I can actually look at where I can say, that's the truth, that's how it was. Uh, not to say that I was, you know, very happy with some of the behaviour, because I think I've changed a lot since then. You know, I'm a, funny, I'm a victim of my own mouth, and, and it's been a long time, but it's like people think I wear crazy glasses still, you know. You look and quite is, normal tonight. Yeah, they are normal. <laughs> I, yeah, I bought them in a proper store. You look relatively normal. If you took relative, away the, the silver normal. trousers, yes, you'd yes. be quite normal. I do have a G-string on underneath. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I had a little peek at your rider, your list of demands for your dressing room. Oh, really? Which was fascinating. I have to say, apparently, because it's winter, the temperature in your dressing room had to be 68 degrees Fahrenheit precisely. See, I have no idea what my rider is. <laughs> I honestly don't. Was it warm enough? It was fine. I was a bit chilly, actually. <laughs> but 68 degrees is a bit chilly. It's a little bit chilly. Yes. <laughs> Uh, well, it gets better. Four large green plants. Well, large green... Well, you have to have green plants, so. <laughs> Three six-foot-long banquet tables covered in white linen tablecloths. Well, they're not in my dressing room. Were you having a banquet in there today? I don't have any six-foot tables <laughs> in my room. No. <laughs> Most amusingly, I thought, was you requested one large flower arrangement. Nothing wrong with that. But you stipulate no chrysanthemums, no lilies, no carnations, and definitely no daisies. Now, what that's... have you got against that lot? Well, chrysanthemums are pretty horrible. <laughs> Carnations don't look good in a vase. Um, lilies don't smell very nice. And daisies I have nothing against whatsoever. <laughs> have you calmed down? I mean, in the old days, you presumably you would have been demanding, you know, vast crates of champagne and all sorts of stuff. I think when, you, when I was drinking and doing drugs, yes, because you become, you know, completely um, ridiculous. I mean, you become self-obsessed, you become... Um, your values completely go out the window. You know, it's, you know, you don't like the colour of the wallpaper on the plane or the way it's done. You don't like the colour of the furniture in the hotel room. It's all that absolute nonsense. Like all entertainers, they're very comfortable on the stage. Mm. And I was, you know, very happy on the stage, but the, off the stage, I didn't really know. I was still the young boy from Pinner who was just kind of insecure, a little overweight, um, and, you know, had a bit of an inferiority complex. That didn't... I just showed off on stage. All entertainers want to do is show off. Do you feel your reputation goes a little bit before you? Yes, I think I'm a bit of a lightning rod. When I say something, it tends to go around the world and I'm stuck with it for the next five or six years. You've been famous for over 40 years now, Elm, and as with all the great rock stars, you like to be bigger and brasher than anybody else. Legendary songwriter, flamboyant entertainer and one of Britain's biggest show-offs, there really is no one quite like Sir Elton John. Elton John is the most successful solo British male singer ever. That's it. No qualifications. He is. I'm still standing better than I ever did. He will be remembered for having written at least a dozen of the best songs that have ever come out of rock.
people get genuinely excited when they see him because he's written a lot of music that has in the soundtrack to a lot of people's lives. Having sold over a quarter of a billion records, Elton is the biggest selling British solo artist in America. I think he's successful because he's extraordinarily talented and his voice is amazing. I think it's heartbreaking. His ability to write some incredible tunes and to be a fantastic showman. And the fact that he's done it as a pianist is amazing. Elton was the reason I started in music. My mum used to play his records all the time, and it actually made me want to be able to play the piano. But it's never just been about the music. There's his quite extraordinary extravagance. I would say that Elton is most famous for spending money. I, I remember Elton invited me to share Christmas with him, and they're giving each other, I think, gold-plated Monopoly sets to each other for, for Christmas. It's like a, an addiction, I think. It's insane, the stuff that he buys. And, of course, there are the outrageous outfits. I remember the wardrobe. It was spectacular. <laughs> the duck suit. I could hardly play for laughing. He's up there in the top five show-offs. He's a major show-off. But with the pressure of mega stardom comes the occasional tantrum. Sat down and he's raging about something. He said, he said, it's a complete and utter catastrophe. And there was silence on the table. Like all of us, when he's overtired and he's been working hard and he's challenged and pressed or things aren't done properly, um, he can get annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> we all have little tantrums from time to time. It's just that his has been filmed in the past. <laughs> I'm beginning to remember why I was feeling a bit uneasy about tonight. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think what, about your character through the prism of that video? Uh, well, I love all the dressing up bit, and it makes me, you know, feel very nostalgic, and it was f so much fun when I did that, and sometimes I went t way too far. Um, um, One of the top five show-offs ever? As probably, yeah. I mean, from, they all come from, from England. Freddie Mercury, I can't think Freddie of anybody Freddie Mercury, Mick Jagger, Rod Stewart, me, and David Bowie. There's five show-offs. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get much bigger than that. <laughs> and they were all British. It's something about the British that like to show off and dress up. It's, I think it's our vaudeville heritage, um, the things we saw on television, the campness of our, our society. Do you plead sort of half merrily guilty to being a diva? Diva? Yeah, I, I, I have been a diva. I'm told that you once asked a member of a, a staff at a hotel, in all seriousness, to stop it being so windy outside. No, I didn't ask... <laughs> <it> was... <laughs> uh, I've been up all night on cocaine and I phoned Robert Key, who... Um, worked for me and became the head of my AIDS foundation. Um, and I phoned him up at 11 in the morning. I said, Robert, it's really windy here. Can you do something about it? <laughs> and there was a kind of silence on the end of the phone. And Robert later told me, he put the phone down and went, she's finally lost it. <laughs> <laughs> she's finally lost the plot. It's too windy. Um, uh, yeah, there's been, I mean, crazy. But that's what you become on drugs. You, you did try and... You demanded that they, before you got on a private jet, that they actually repaint it. You didn't like the colour. That was... Um, yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> it was a 707. It was, like, a turd colour. <laughs> so, like, an enormous flying turd. Did you, um, did you so get on it? I, I got on it flying like that. And then it was called the Starship. And we had it painted... The record company paid for it. And it, they painted it beautiful, with all stars over it and... Uh, and everyone who used it afterwards was very grateful because you landed in a place on a 707 and I thought, God, what's that piece of shit? You know, <laughs> literally. No, it, I, you know, I was in a position to do that and it was fun. We were having fun, so, yeah, let's paint the plane. Do you regret the bad behaviour or do you accept no, that it was...? No, because I learned from it. No, yeah. I, you know, the bad behaviour I regret was when, I, you know, I was doing drugs and alcohol and I couldn't remember the bad behaviour because I got up the next day and Bernie Taupin, my lyricist, would ring me up and said, I'm never coming out with you again if you did what you did last night. And I said, what did I do? He said, you don't remember. And I said, no, I don't. Because, you know, you drank so much that I can't, couldn't remember. It's called a blackout. Were there any people in your life through the worst period who could say, oh, just stop that or shut up? Everyone who loved me. Everyone. Did you listen to any of them? No, I told them to bugger off. In fact, I, they wrote me letters um, saying, you know, for Christ's sake, put it, stop putting that bloody stuff up your nose. 
and, and I wouldn't speak to them for years. Like, how dare you? It's that when you're confronted by people who tell you the truth and you know you're being an asshole, and I knew I was being an asshole, it's like even worse. So you think, right, I'm not talking to you because I know I'm an asshole, so I don't need you to tell me. I mean, the only addiction that you have continued with, it seems it's to spending. me... It's spending. It's spending. Yes. Tell me about your relationship with money. There's no getting away from it. It's fun to have money. I mean, could you go back to being poor? I, listen, I said to David, I would live with you in a, a caravan as long as I had you. Um, I, I could do that. that. I thought we'd have to be a gold caravan, wouldn't no, it? No, I wouldn't. No? No, I'm not that facile. I'm not that, I'm not that shallow. But you really believe you could do that? Yes, You'd of give course. it all up and... Yeah, I could. I mean, I think about it sometimes. I think, oh, it'd be nice just to bugger off and buy a little house somewhere and just, you know, have a simple life. But you, you, I'm too far gone in now. You can't run away like that. Um, but it does cross your mind sometimes when you feel a bit overwhelmed. But, I, yeah, I'm not that shallow and I'm not facile. I could... If I had David in my life and my friends, I could live anywhere. I'm just very, very fortunate. I have a career that's not going away, so I'm very comfortable with where I am with my spending. I buy really beautiful things that turn into a profit. What's the most you spend in a single day on a spree? On a spree? I, well, I bought a photograph for a million dollars. And that was, you know, a photograph. Must have been a bloody good picture. <laughs> it was a Man Ray. And uh, I, I've been collecting photography now since 1991, and David and I have probably the biggest private collection of photography, and I'm very serious about it. I don't talk about it but you much. see, that, that kind of investment, <clears throat> I get it. It's like, a, it's like you know, great cars or great yeah. houses, great yeah. art, great photographs. Yeah. They're an investment. I, I'm talking about the day you went to Versace and apparently spent over £250,000 in one spree. I have no guilt, Piers. I, I own the money. I pay my taxes. I've never lived anywhere else but Britain. I can do what if I want to buy... I mean, buy that it. is true. I mean, you do I pay taxes. I, you know, why can't I? It goes back into the economy. What's the, what's the problem? <laughs> what is the problem? What's the, what's the single item you've bought in your life that's brought you the most happiness? Vibrator, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> a, a gold one. A gold one. <laughs> this is how bleak it was. I lost all my friends. My mother left the country. And I look back, I shudder at the behaviour and what I was doing to myself. <laughs> If only every story had such a perfect ending. Grant's Whiskey. Sponsors Piers Morgan's Life Stories. Gold is... ...story waiting to unfold. Grant's Whiskey. Sponsors Piers Morgan's Life Stories. You've always had a lot to say. You're a very opinionated guy. Yeah. You're not afraid to shoot right. your mouth off if you feel like it. You recently ruffled Simon Cowell's feathers by describing the X Factor as brain crippling and boring. <laughs> Why did you wade in on that? I can't watch those kind of shows. Um, I find it very dis disturbing for me from the artist's point of view. I'm totally on the artist's side, anybody who appears on the show, whether they've got not much talent or not. If they win it, I wonder what's going to become of them. Are they just fodder uh, for two years until the next Leona Lewis comes on or the next Alexandra Burke? Why, are, you know, why aren't they going on tour? What's happening? They just can't survive, I know, economically by making records. It's the cart before the horse. When I got a record contract in the old days, uh, you had to go on tour to get a record contract. Um, you know, you had to be good live. And now it's like you can be on television and sing well, but you have no real experience of doing shows. And the thing that really prepares you to be an artist and, and a, an artist who has long, a long life, a long shelf life, is by doing those five or six years, what I did when I left school and had a professional band and backed a lot of American stars uh, and played the toilets, drove up the M1 in a van. That gave me all the experience I needed that when I did make it in Los Angeles in 1970, I was ready. I was experienced enough to know what I was doing. Um, but when you see I, an artist I, like Leona Lewis, for example, yeah who has been number one in America, where well, they don't even have X Factor yet, so no. it wasn't down to the power of the TV show. No. It doesn't part of you like the sort of the magic of taking ordinary people, like Leona, who was a secretary, like I'm not, Susan, blam I'm not blaming Leona. And they Leona have their Lewis. moment. I mean... I'm not against them. I'm all for them. But you're against I, the I system I get concerned that... about them. Right. That's my point. What's going to happen? Because those kind of shows just throw up people all the time. Yes, but isn't the music industry exactly the same? People get dropped all the time like that. They, it is now. It never used to be. Nowadays, if an artist hasn't 
made it by their second album, they get dropped. I mean, my first album was Empty Sky, it wasn't a hit. I was allowed to make a very, very expensive album in those days called Elton John, which had your song on it, became a hit. But these days, after Empty Sky, I wouldn't have been signed for the Elton John record. In the early, in the early people cared about music. You had great people running record companies. You had great record people in Britain and America. Nowadays, you have cowboys. Strong words. Mm. <laughs> You're going to be singing a couple of songs for us later. Your piano, which I understand you call Nina. I've got many pianos that I call things. But one's Nina's... called Winifred. <laughs> this one's called Nina. <laughs> Winifred Atwell, Diana after Diana Crawl, and one called Aretha after Aretha Franklin. Really? Yeah. I don't have one called Mrs. Mills. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, anyway. What people may not know is that you began playing the piano when you were just three years old. Yeah, I played by ear, and I grew up in a house full of women. My mother, my grandmother, and my auntie, and they all loved music. There you are. Oh. A sweet little chap. You didn't know that I just shit myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Were you naturally gifted, do you think? I think I was naturally gifted, yeah. I had a gift um, for playing by ear. I could pick things up very quickly. I was surrounded by music all the time, and then when I got to about six, seven years old, seven years of age, my parents made me have piano lessons, and that was a very good and clever thing of them to do because it gave me another uh, insight, which I was in very grateful for. It meant I went to the Royal Academy when I was 11 to 15. You uh, once said about your, your hands, but they're not classic no, pianist they're hands. Chipolata fingers, I call myself. <laughs> um, I, I can just get, get over one octave, but they're not pianist hands. That's why I was never going to be a classical pianist, nor did I want to be, but, you know, to be a wonderful classical pianist, you really do have to have long fingers. Could you have been one, if you put your mind no. to it? No. And I wouldn't want to be. I, I wanted... As soon as I heard Jerry Lee Lewis and Little Richard, I, that's all I wanted to play like. Did your parents encourage you? Musically? My mum did, absolutely, of course. Uh, my dad was a bit snobbish about rock and roll, didn't like it very much. Well, he um, was an RAF man, right? So yeah, yeah, but he was in a big band. He played with Bob Miller and the Miller Men. But rock and roll was really... An, it was a revolutionary thing. When Elvis Presley came out and my mum came back with Heartbreak Hotel, that changed her life and it changed my life because it was like, what is this? At 14, you began performing in local pubs. Yeah. What was that like? Terrifying. I was in the public bar at the Northwood Hills Hotel, situated, thank God, by the window, so that when fights broke out, I could just dive through the window. <laughs> You'd be in the middle of April showers by Al Jolson, and suddenly a beer bottle would come spray over <laughs> And I played, you know, all the... My old man said, follow the band, all the old Cockney songs, Al Jolson songs, and then I started to sing. I got a microphone and an amp, and I started to sing as well. As you got going in the music and began performing and everything else, your, your mum was supportive, but your dad began to really not like this. He wanted to be, be a bank manager and... Or join the Air Force. You know, he probably thought rock and roll, it's, you know... It, when it did start, it was deemed to be outrageous. Mm. I mean, it's, you know, God almighty, you know. God almighty, it was the 50s. And so when rock and roll came in, my dad thought, you know, this is not the job for my boy. I want him to have, I want him to have security. So he was looking at me from a fatherly point of view, saying, well, this is all very well and the good, but, you know, this is never... Rock and roll was never going to last, right? Never going to last. It's always going to... Give it two or three years. When my parents got divorced, my dad used to write to my mum and say, I'm very worried about Reg. He's becoming a wide boy and he's got no future uh, doing this kind of thing. And, you know, it's... Get all those dreams of rock and roll out of his head. He's never going to make it. And, you know... And my mum's still got the letters, so... Um, really? You know, he's never going to make it. So, yes! <laughs> but the thing is, when I did make it, my dad never came to see me. Never came to see me play. And how did you feel about that? I was crushed. There was never a closeness between us, and it wasn't his fault or my fault. It was just not... We just weren't meant to be together, really. And that happens, and as, as I've got older, I've become much more um, comfortable with it. Um, do, you think, do you think he loved you? Or did you feel that I think he may have loved me in his own way. He never told me he loved me, and he never put his arm around me, ever. I would love my dad to have given me a hug, given me a kiss, told me he loved me. That would have meant so much to me. But again, it probably wouldn't... I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you if that had happened, because I was so driven to prove you are going to love me, you are going to be proud of me, that, um, you know, that's what completely drove me. In 1967, 20-year-old Elton John replied to an ad in a music newspaper seeking budding songwriters. The ad brought him together with Bernie Taupin, and they hit it off immediately. They quickly forged a writing partnership. Bernie did the words, Elton the music. 
With a clutch of songs under their belts, they were snapped up by music mogul Dick James, who sent Elton to tour America. Virtually unknown, Elton was booked to play a low-key series of shows, kicking off at the legendary Troubadour Club in Los Angeles. Nobody could have predicted just how big he was going to become. When I first saw him at the Troubadour, I think he perhaps was slightly nervous or something. You know, after the first week, became a little bit more flamboyant, where he'd jump up and down on the piano, and people loved that. I mean, it just, they'd go insane. Within a year, Elton had two albums in the top ten of the Billboard chart. He captured the hearts of America. People could not imagine what it would be like to live without him. There was always something on the radio. And as a consequence, the mania just grew and grew and grew. I remember we played Houston. When he walked out, without introduction or anything, the crowd just went completely nuts. And it was a feeling of, OK, this is what this is now. This is big. I was lucky, because I was in a band, to be that huge on your own. I don't know how he coped with it, to be honest. The problem was Elton wasn't coping. Having become so famous so quickly, and with all the temptations that rock and roll lifestyle brings, Elton began to unravel. The pressures of being that person eventually get to you, so you start to drink a little bit. I mean, you know, he used to drink, uh, like, a, a bottle of brandy on stage every night in the early days, but that was all he did. But it quickly became more than just booze. There was a period of time in the music business when cocaine was everywhere. There'd be a rose bowl on the table, you know, full of cocaine, and it's just like, help, help yourself. He came down and announced that he'd taken, like, 60 Valiums or something like that, you know. And I think his granny said, oh, that, that boy, he's a terrible... You know, and like, well, actually, he's just going to have a major overdose here. Elton's cocktail of drink and drugs had a profound effect on his health. He's claimed that at one time he was snorting a line of cocaine every four minutes. It was OK. The first few years were OK. And I think as the years went by, it affected it more and more and more. You know, I'd see performances on stage where I thought, you know, he doesn't look so great today. Elton's drug habit continued for 15 years until he eventually decided enough was enough. If he hadn't gone to the, the rehab thing in Chicago, I think he, would, he wouldn't be with us anymore. I think he would have just done so much and OD'd and done. How close did drugs come to killing you, do you think? Very close. I mean, I would have um, an epileptic seizure and turn blue, and people would find me on the floor and, you know, put me to bed. And then 40 minutes later, I'd be snorting another line. My life was... I mean, this is how bleak it was. I'd stay up, I'd smoke joints, drink a bottle of Johnny Walker, and then I'd stay up for three days, and then I'd go to sleep for a day and a half, get up, and because I was so hungry that I didn't eat anything, I'd binge and have, like, three bacon sandwiches, a pot of ice cream, and then I'd throw it up because I became bulimic, and then go and do the whole thing over again. It's, that is how tragic my life was. I mean, and, it, and I'm not being flippant when I say that. It's, when I look back, I shudder at the behaviour and, 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 and what I was doing to myself. And, you know, it just takes over your whole psyche, this stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I never considered myself a drug addict. I thought drug addicts were people that stuck needles in their arms. And, and I was the biggest junkie there was. was. Was any of it fun? It was fun in the early days, cos I thought, being shy, the cocaine, because it made me talk, was the key to smart. I, I can talk now, I'm, I can be one of the gang, I can fit in. Um, it was a false alarm, and um, it set me on the road to um, near enough ruin. Um, how, how did you notice it changing your personality? Well, I lost all my friends. I mean, and all the people that loved me didn't want to know me. Um, my mother left the country, um, and, you know, you find yourself in the most degrading situations. Um, your, your personal habits, you don't wash. You lose all sense of pride and all sense of uh, esteem and, um, and you can't seem to stop. Have you always been an addicted personality? I think so, yeah. With the thing that rescued me, Piers, was that I kept working during the drugs. I, I didn't stop for two or three years and hide away, otherwise I would be dead. I still made records and I still went out on tour. And that saved my life.
You're going to do a song from the new album for us now, Elton. Which one are you going to sing? It's called When Love Is Dying. When love is dying. Some of the greatest stories in life are those you can taste. Grant's... The flavour of a good whisky tells its own story. Grant's Whisky sponsors Piers Morgan's Life Stories. Explain why you changed your name from Reginald Dwight to Elton John. Because there's no way on earth that if you're a singer, Reginald Dwight <laughs> is going to ring that bell. <laughs> Here, no way. Ladies and gentlemen, oh. Caesar's Palace, Las Vegas. Reginald, Reginald Dwight. Dwight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great. No. Hey, it was as simple as that, was it? Yes, of course. You've made 30 albums. You've right. sold a quarter of a billion records. Yeah. And that makes you officially, in terms of solo artists, our most successful ever performer in this country. How does that make you feel? I, um... I don't really think about things like that. I, I'm always looking to the future rather than the past. Um, you must be proud, though, aren't you? I'm proud of my career, but there are, yeah, I'm terribly proud of my career. Um, but there's also been other things I've been proud of as well, like being the chairman of a successful soccer club and writing musicals. And you know, I'm always looking. David will tell you, I'm never one to get nostalgic. Um, but of course, I'm proud of it. Yeah. I what mean, was the, the song you're most proud of? That's really hard. To I know it's like to... choosing your, your favourite child, but what, what is it? Well, I have to say. I have been very fortunate in having a partner who writes the lyrics. Without him, I don't... The lyrics come first. Bernie um, comes from Lincolnshire, now lives in Los Angeles, um, and wrote your song when he was 17 years of age. Now, that lyric is an extraordinary lyric, and I've never got fed up with singing it. So I, if I'm going to pick one, I'd say, that's never gotten old. I knew when I wrote that song that I'd written my first really great song. Have you always been good friends? Or have yeah. you had We've Rocky never, Paris? ever had an argument. And I've never lost the satisfaction of when I write a song, call him in and see his face. It's never changed from the early days of Skyline Pigeon to the last album with Leon Russell. It's that look on his face when he loves it and I think, oh, I've pleased him, I've done something great. Do you think you could have made it without him? No. No way. Your latest album, The Union, is your biggest hit in America since the early 70s. Yeah. And it's become this phenomenal success for you. An extraordinary development in your career there, because, no. you know, through the 80s, 90s, maybe it was slowing down. Now, suddenly, yeah. back you are. You're going to do a song from the new album for us now, Elton. Which one are you going to sing? It's called When Love Is Dying.
pain you never can explain it cuts so deep time and time again i felt it then i feel it now but nobody told me how to fight a world of hurt somebody help me now nobody ever tells you well, love is dying when love is dying it just gets a little colder we stop trying we stop trying you yeah, we stop trying oh, oh, oh when love is dying love never gets to show you and i never got to know you no, we never stood a chance when love was dying. Love never makes it easy, and I never got that feeling. No, we never stood a chance when love was dying. Nobody ever tells you. It's a little colder We stop trying We stop trying Yeah, we stop trying Oh, oh When love is dying I couldn't believe how you held it together. I had to hold it together. I, had, I couldn't afford not to. It was just probably the biggest honour of my life. If only... Our whiskey is a story waiting to unfold. Grant's Whiskey. Sponsors Piers Morgan's Life Stories. Pinky D, who you once had a huge hit with, said that you were the most loyal friend to have in the world. And there was one person in particular that you showed that loyalty to. In 1981, Elton was invited to perform at Prince Andrew's 21st birthday party. That evening, he struck up a conversation with the future Princess of Wales, Lady Diana Spencer. They got on famously and even danced to Charleston together. Elton and Diana were um, spiritually very close. Um, I think they both felt people, uh, they felt a kinship, um, her having overcome an eating disorder very publicly, Elton having overcome a triple addiction very publicly um, and sort of coming through it with humility and, and health. I think they felt a real bond there. They were like that. Really, really close. I'm sure that he was probably one of her major confidants. And um, they loved each other a lot. When she would come down and visit us for lunch, uh, it was just always laughter. Gossip and laughter. Diana loved a good gossip and she loved to have fun. But on the 31st of August, 1997, their friendship came to a tragic end. It was a friend in London who had been out early in the morning and had heard the news on the streets and sent us a fax and said, I'm so sorry to hear about your loss. Um, my love is with you this time. And Elton said, oh my God, what is it now? Um, and we switched on the television and we realized it was Diana. 
I remember talking to Elton the next morning, and he was just inconsolable. You know, he was just completely done in. People in the media started to just play Candle in the Wind when they were putting tributes to Diana together in news stories. The song seemed to fit. Um, Elton was one of her closest musical friends, and Elton was, was happy to accept the sort of role as musical elder statesman um, and take that on. Elton and songwriting partner Bernie Taupin famously rewrote Candle in the Wind as a special tribute to Diana. Elton was invited to perform the song at her funeral in Westminster Abbey. I do not know where Elton got the strength from to perform at Diana's funeral without breaking down. The stress that he was under was so, it was immeasurable. You could never measure. The entire world, the entire world was looking at him. And it seems to me you lived your life like a candle in the wind. We got home and we switched on the television and at that point the funeral cortege was just pulling through the gates of um, Althorpe and that's when he broke down. It's when all the people were standing on the side of the road throwing the flowers on top of the hearse. Um, he completely went to pieces. Your legend ever will. How difficult was that day for you? Being invited to the funeral anyway was an incredible honour. To be asked to sing at it was a double-edged sword. Um, it was a huge honour, but it was a huge responsibility because that was the biggest media event of, for God knows how long. Um, everyone in the world, as Sharon said, was looking at me. Um, so I knew that I had to sing it properly and I knew I couldn't afford to break down. I was really being the ambassador for people who loved her and, you know, we had this new lyric that I wasn't totally au fait with, so I had a teleprompter because I thought, if I sing Goodbye Norma Jean, I'm going to get guillotined here. <laughs> um, I, I didn't want to make a mistake. I counted on all my years of experience as a, a performer and an artist and I knew my responsibilities. And I knew that I have to keep the stiff upper lip on this occasion because, you know, nobody wants to see a performer crying when they're at a service. You've got to be stoic. You've got to do it and do it movingly, doing it without any emotion, really. Um, emotion in what you're singing, but not emotion with tears coming down your face. I think there's a point in the third verse where my voice cracked a little bit. And that was probably through nerves, not through emotion. But it was almost a faultless performance. And I couldn't believe how you held it together. I had to hold it together. I, had, I couldn't afford not to. It was probably the biggest honour of my life on the saddest, one of the saddest days I'd ever go through. No, I'll never forget that summer. What was Diana like? Great fun, laughter, gossip, you know, what films have you seen? What records do you like? Um, she was easy peasy. She would go, she had the ability. I think her greatest magic was, and you know, people sometimes her critics will groan, but the greatest ability she made people feel at ease. She would walk up to someone and make you felt that you'd known her all your life, and she'd calm you down immediately. Um, and that's the effect she had on people with AIDS. And she was always, always talking about how she could help people. And um, and she was a damn good mum. You've described yourself as the most famous homosexual in the world. What made you finally come out? I was very comfortable with my sexuality. I wasn't hung up about it. I was living with a man. I was living with my manager. Um, and I thought the whole world knew. And, of course, when I did, did break in England, I was chairman of a football club, Watford mm. Football Club. And I was in Edinburgh with my mum. I'd done a concert the night before, and she bought the morning paper in, and she said, You'll have a look at this. It was the Daily Mirror, and it said, Elton's I'm gay. And I went, oh, Christ, we're going to Rochdale today. <laughs> uh, and I can't count on Gracie Fields being there for help. One of the reasons, I guess, why people were surprised is that despite the lifestyle you were leading, giving clues... I'm very bloke here, butch, right? <laughs> yes, but, uh... It was the fact that you'd been engaged to a woman when you were 21, right. and you then married another woman. So yeah. you had... Well, you clearly been at least bisexual, which was, yeah. I guess, as a public image, quite confusing to people. I, I, I enjoyed being married to Renata, and she was the greatest person, one of the greatest people I've ever met, as a human being and as a loving person. And I don't want to talk about it too much because 
one of the things I agree about, I agree with her, is that I don't really mention her much. She wants to get on with her life. She's never but said I, a bad word about you. She's never said a bad word, and I will never say a bad word about her. Um, it's just, uh, if you want the answer, when I was in bed with her and we were having sex, it was great, but I thought, you know, I'm, this is not right. I'd rather probably be with a man. Did you? I mean, did you fancy women? Yeah, of course. There's so many beautiful women in the world. You still do? Oh, yeah. I, how can you not think a woman's beautiful? I well, mean, I agree with you, but I'm not I gay. Know. I mean... <laughs> but don't you, do you think men are beautiful sometimes? Oh, well, not in quite the same way. Not sexually, no. Yeah, you, I don't see? look at you and think, whoa. Oh, I wouldn't think you would. <laughs> uh, you know, what about George Clooney? Could you... Uh, <laughs> Like George, no. no, no, I don't. You see, no. that's the trouble with you fucking heterosexuals. <laughs> I don't really think the nasty side of Elton comes out very much. Not to him, anyway. Maybe we've had a couple of rows, and we never go to bed without sorting it out. He's my soulmate. You can tell everybody this is your song. It may be quiet. Some of the greatest stories in life are the Brigades disgusting. Join John Sargent. Do they speak? No. As a hardy bunch of celebrities join forces to become celebrity grime fighters. Do you want to hold it? No, I don't, darling. None of this Namby Pamby TV stuff. Thursday at 9, ITV1 and ITV1 HD. The flavour of a good whiskey tells its own story. Grant's Whiskey sponsors Piers Morgan's Life Stories. Oh, you've had an amazing life, an amazing career, but the absolute icing on the cake for you has been a relationship with a certain Canadian. It was 1993. Elton had been clean and sober for three years and was in a good place, but there was still something missing from his life. I think Elton was a very lonely person. There's no two ways about it. I think that when Elton met David, it was a time when he was... Um, quite sad and he needed somebody in his life. That person was David Furnish, a 31-year-old Canadian advertising executive who Elton first set eyes on at a dinner party at his home. It was a completely random dinner invitation. You know, went feeling very nervous and not knowing what to expect. I thought I would meet a very self-centered um, person who would, you know, welcome us all to his home and sit back and regale us with stories of his glorious past. I was taken aback by how handsome he was in person and, and the, the um, sparkle he had in his eyes. I went from feeling like a house guest to thinking, gosh, I, f I find this man incredibly attractive. Elton and David began to fall in love. I've never known Elton to be happier for a steady period as he has since he met David. They're kind of quite nicely balanced and David's very patient as you have to be. <laughs> in May 2005, Elton popped the question and asked David to become his civil partner. He put a ring box up on the table and got down on his knee in front of me, in front of everybody at the table, and he said, will you be my life partner? Elton and David's partnership was an historic landmark. I think they did that on the first day it was possible to do it. And so it got it off to a good start. We thought we can have great impact and put a very hopefully positive message out into the world and maybe change some people's attitudes. It was a real royal wedding. Thousands of people came out to the, into the street to, you know, to show how happy they were, to support them. We couldn't believe the crowds. I mean, there were thousands of people with banners and cakes and balloons and cards, and all the world's media was there. Five years on, their relationship is still going strong. I think. Elton has realised this is the most important relationship of his life and he can't mess it up. Consequently, he puts a lot of effort into not letting nasty Elton come out. I think, you know, if you look for love, it often eludes you. And I think if you just go through life in a positive position and let love find you, it, it often does. When, when did you realise David was the one for you? It was so weird, because I, I had 
ask someone to bring some people down for dinner because I'd come back from America. I had no gay friends in England anymore, really. Um, all my friends were in AA and stuff like that. So I was rattling around at the house and I thought it'd be nice to meet some people. Um, and I definitely had no ideas of having a relationship. I was going to stay single for a while. And I was always looking for relationships all throughout my life. Um, and so when David walked through the door that night, it, I, there was something that immediately clicked with him. And then we talked and we had fun. He came down with um, three other friends and we had a lovely evening. And I, we talked, I took him on a tour of the house and we spent a lot of time just talking about what he, you know, his life. I'm not really into, I don't spend my life talking about what I do. I'm more interested in what other people do. And, and, and his life, I thought, God, he's an intelligent man. He's got a great job, his own flat, wow. Um, you know, that's a difference. <laughs> and with David, I, I surreptitiously got his phone number, although everyone spotted it. And I was so excited, I thought, I'd love to see him again. And I phoned him up the next day, it was a Saturday, a Sunday. Um, and they were all off to a Halloween party, so they all left. And Saturday, I thought, what's the, after Halloween party, what's the appropriate time to call someone? So I waited till 11 o'clock and I called him and um, I said, well, I really enjoyed seeing last night, would you like to have dinner in London, have a takeaway, and so we had a lovely takeaway, and, and we, you know, we kind of, our, our romance was instant but slow, I and mean, we didn't live together for quite a while. The thing I struck me about David was from the word go, he was, you know, it, he wasn't in awe of me, he was always gonna be confrontational, he would always tell me the truth. Um, we do, I've learned the relationships have to be 50-50, and when Janet just said, you know, about the nasty, I don't really think the nasty side of Elton comes out very much, not to him anyway. Maybe we've had a couple of rows. And we never go to bed without sorting it out. We never, go to, bed, we never go to bed angry with each other. He's my soulmate. He's the person that I speak to first thing in the morning and last thing at night. And, you know, every week, this is going to be so cheesy, but I'm going to tell you. <laughs> um, every week since we've met, um, we met on a Saturday. No matter where we've been, we send each other a card and write about whether we're together or if I'm in America and he's in England, I courier and he couriers the card to me. So that every Saturday we open a card and we read what we have to write and we express our love for each other in it. You've done that for 17 thanks. years? Huh? For 17 years? Every you've done Saturday. That. It is funny, I mean, I, I would argue having been in the media for 20-odd years in this country, when this kind of discussion would not have got that kind of reaction. And you and David had been a, a real trailblazing couple. When you got married, it was the first day that you could do that. It was just a wonderful opportunity to be able to... I've been through so many situations where same-sex couples have... Um, when one of them's died, the other couple has been left by the other person, his other partner, and then the families have come in and taken everything because the other person has no rights. This gave us rights, um, as we should have. And because we are a famous gay couple, probably the most famous gay couple, we wanted to do it on the first day and say, yeah, this is great. This is a wonderful opportunity for us. Thank you for what you've given to us. This is what we've been waiting for, and we're going to celebrate it. So, I mean, I was incredibly moved on that day to see how many people came out. Well, that was amazing. Yeah. I mean, again, you couldn't have imagined that scene in Britain 30 years before. It wouldn't have happened. No. It was so moving. I mean, we were astonished. I mean, we thought we might get the old fl odd flower bomb coming our way. <laughs> you know, but uh, not one bad thing. And uh, for that, that's why I live in this country. That's why I love the British public. That's why I always called this place my home. And because I was so grateful for that. I was so proud of this country um, for doing that. Are you as happy as you've ever been now? Yeah, I'm totally, totally the happiest I've ever been. Um, and it's taken me a long time to get here. It took me 43 years to get sober, and it took me about three or four years after that after to work on myself. But it's been worth the work, and it's been worth the wait, and I don't regret anything in my life because it's got me to where I am now. You, you said earlier that your song was probably your, your favourite because of the, the circumstances behind how you wrote it and everything else. Of all the people that you've ever met in your life, if you could dedicate it tonight to one, who would it be? David. Elton, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Elton John, ladies and gentlemen. Right.
It's a little bit funny This feeling inside I'm not one of those who can Easily hide I don't have much money Boy, if I did I'd buy a big house where We both could live up If I was a sculptor, but then again, no, or a man who makes potions in a, a traveling show. I know it's not much, but it's the best I can do. My gift and my song, and this one's for you. You can tell everybody This is your song It may be quite simple But now that it's done I hope you don't mind I hope you don't mind That I put down in words How wonderful life is While you're in the world Sat on the roof and kicked up the moss. Well, a few all the verses, oh, they got me quite cry. But the sun been quite kind. Well, I wrote that song. It's for people like you that keep it turned on. So excuse me for getting But these things I do You see I forgot If they're green or they're blue Anyway the things What I really mean Oh yours are the sweetest eyes I've ever seen Tell everybody This is your song It may be quite simple But now that it's done Hope you don't mind Hope you don't mind That I'll put down in words How wonderful life is While you're in the world I hope you don't mind that I'll put down in the world How wonderful life is while you're in the Bosses at London's oldest and most famous hotel allowed cameras to film its epic revamp, which started in 2007 and cost £220 million. The first of two parts, The Savoy, is tomorrow night at nine. Hugh Grant and Drew Barrymore star in our movie After the News. That's music and lyrics. <laughs>